start by reminding you who I am in case you have uh, forgotten because it was reminded, I was told, we didn't introduce you. And I thought, well, by this point, you all know me, right? But just in case you don't, um, I'm Rabbi Barbara Tita. I teach at UNC Charlotte, all things Jewish. Um, I write uh, books that are largely about uh, toxic things. And I come to this church to share fellowship and love. And it actually all fits together. So there you are. So I thought I would do something I haven't done in a while, which is to sing you something. I'm going to sing you the prayer that I am going to be speaking to you about. I'm going to ask you to excuse the mask. My husband's been diagnosed with pneumonia, so I'm not taking any chances on bringing anything else home to the poor man. Um, and I'm hoping everybody can hear me all right. Am I correct? Good. Wonderful. So I'm going to start with the prayer that we're going to be talking about. It's called Modeani or Modaani, depending on your gender and sexual identification. So I will be singing Modaani because my pronouns are indeed she, her, and hers. And no, you don't actually need to know what I'm saying right now. You just need to kind of let it sink in. Modaani. Lefanecha melechai vekayam vekayam modani lefanecha melechai vekayam vekayam Shechazarta bi nishmati bem la raba emunatecha. Shechazarta bi nishmati bem la raba emunatecha. Modani lefanecha melechai v'kayam v'kayam Modani lefanecha melechai v'kayam v'kayam Shechazarta bi nishmati behem la raba emunatecha. Shechazarta bi nishmati behem la raba emunatecha. I give thanks before you, eternal and living God, who returns my soul within me with mercy. Great is your faithfulness. Modeani is a very brief prayer, one of the briefest you can possibly say. Each morning, in 12 words only, a Jewish person recites this prayer of simple gratitude, which is inexplicably related to the text we have been studying for several weeks, the text of Lamentations, the text of terror, the text of anguish, the text of pain and sorrow, and even hopelessness. Why would Jewish tradition insist that we recite thanks, recite a statement of what seems to be hope and even faith in the shadow of a text that actually describes utter despair and consuming anguish? 
How is it that we imagine that grief or lament or sorrow can actually offer a pathway to gratitude and thanks, to some kind of reconciliation with God and a deeper understanding of faith? I give thanks before you, eternal and living God, who returns my soul within me with mercy. Great is your faithfulness. Please remember, and I'll get back to it, that after the word mercy, I paused. The English gives you many more words because Hebrew is a quite condensed language, but 12 words only. Now I want to read you a poem after this statement. I'm gonna read Moda Ani again, and then I'm gonna read you a poem that is just about the same length. Again, one more time. I give thanks before you, eternal and living God, who returns my soul within me with mercy, great, is your faithfulness. Look closely and you will see almost everyone carrying bags of cement on their shoulders. That's why it takes courage to get out of bed in the morning and climb into the day. That second poem was written by a Jew Gabriel Edward Hirsch, after the suicide of his son. I'll read it again. Look closely and you will see almost everyone carrying bags of cement on their shoulders. That's why it takes courage to get out of bed in the morning and climb into the day. Can you hear that that is also a prayer? Both of these are prayers. So what is Ani? What is that prayer? 12 easy words. You can time it. It will take 12 seconds for me to say Ani, not to sing it. That takes longer, but only 12 seconds to say it. You have a prayer for setting holy intentions every morning. This is the first prayer that a Jew says upon awakening. Moda Ani reminds us you must acknowledge this great gift of life, the Creator's mercy and compassion, and prepare yourself for living intentionally, for living intentionally. So you wake to this prayer. Immediately following this prayer is one I also told you about, where you go to the bathroom, you wash your hands, you raise up your hands and you say, may I lift up my hands in service, right? So people think it's about washing hands, but the words literally are al natilat yadaim, to lift up your hands in service. Interestingly, you also say prayers thanking God that all of your orifices are working correctly after you've gone to the bathroom. Generally, when I tell non-Jews about this, they go, you've got to be joking. And just as generally, I tell them of a man I saw as a volunteer chaplain at Northeast Medical many years ago who had been in the hospital for six months due to a cancer diagnosis. He had a wall like covered with cards. And when I went in to see him, he was just on the cusp of being able to go home. And I said, what is it that needs to happen before you get to go home? And he says, I have to pee on my own. A word that I was never taught to say and which when I came south and learned that people said all the time kind of made me go. But okay, we, we were always taught, you know, you, I'm going to the bathroom. That's how you say that. And I said, well, that's fine. We're going to pray for pee now. Because I came from a tradition that understood that when you wake up, knowing that you can still lift your hands in service, knowing that things will move through your body so that your body can function, only those of us who know what it's like to have these functions cease, stop, 
be prevented. Know what that means for our ability to move in the world. So all of these things come together. They're combined. And waking with Moda'ani is a challenge, as the poet clearly said, right? The poet who lost his son. How do I wake up and have the courage to get out of bed and climb into the day? So before I tell you more, I want to ask you this. Think back to a time when you woke up in the morning and the first thing that hit you was sorrow, grief, or despair. Almost all of you are carrying a bag of cement. And now, if you are comfortable sharing what it was that felt like that bag of cement, can I have three people say, I remember when I woke up and this was the thing I was having to face? Any of you feel safe sharing that? If it helps, I'll start. It'll always be this for me, I think, until, God forbid, something serious happens to my husband, or God forbid, to my child. God willing, I won't see either one, but I have known what it is to wake up in the morning and know again my sister is dying. Okay. Can any of you, can I get one or two people to recall that? Yes, ma'am. And so like the key thing is you have your, the loss is there, you cannot say goodbye, it's come like a hammer upon you, unexpected, out of the blue, no way to prepare and no way to recover. Not that opportunity to say goodbye. Okay, yes ma'am. I don't think there can be any worse pain than losing a child. I just don't. Yes, sir. Oh my God, David. So you want now collectively to honor what you've just heard, the death of a child, of a best friend, the death of a brother and a sister, the death of an aunt. And you want to say a prayer, may their memories be for a blessing. You make their memories a blessing by how you remember and speak about them. But nobody can gainsay the kind of pain that the three of you woke up with. And I believe there was one other hand over here, Debbie.
still waking up the next day knowing that my life has changed forever and there's no going back. Alone the last three weeks in which my husband has been sleeping in our son's room because he's been sweating through the blankets every night with his high fever, right? And just, I had, literally yesterday, I was thinking about two friends who had lost their husbands and was, you know, just sort of anticipatory stuff going on in my body. That's how I woke up yesterday morning with his, how is he? What would this be like if, right? <coughs> honor each other's pain and then you shall honor what it is to not know how to climb out of bed. It takes courage. So how do we say moda or moda ani? I want you to really think about the question I'm gonna ask here. How do you say that simply when you are also mindful of the grief of your friends, the sorrows of your neighbors, the pain of the world, how do you do this prayer and celebrate a personal victory over death every morning, thank you for returning my soul to me, without narcissism? Oh, thank you, I got this, and my neighbor is dealing with the death of a child. My neighbor is dealing with the death of siblings. My neighbor is dealing with the death of a husband. My neighbor is in Ukraine. You see what I'm saying? How do you do that? How do you resolve the mandate to say this prayer every morning with that much grief? In other words, what I'm asking you is how do you do that with the Book of Lamentations sitting on your desk? Because you all have a lament. So, do you remember I asked you, please note that I paused after the word mercy? Do you remember that? I'm going to talk to you about that now. So, I'm going to say modani again, I'm going to pause again, and then I'm going to explain something. I give thanks before you, eternal and living God, who returns my soul within me with mercy. Great is your faithfulness. Rabba ba'emunatecha, great is your faithfulness. The rabbis say you must stop before saying that. You must pause. It's a liturgical mandate, you have to stop. No explanation, you just have to stop. So when I first was learning about this prayer, I was asking why? Why do we have to stop? What's the point here? Because if there is nothing, if not deliberation, when the rabbis say do A or do B. Now I can honestly tell you a lot of the time I disagree with what the rabbis have to say. Most of the time they're a bunch of aging white guys. <laughs> so you know, there's a lot of time where I say, yeah, right, very nice for you, not so good for all sorts of other contexts. Let's duke it out. And I do duke it out with them. So why, I asked myself. Cross-references, literary allusions are never accidental in Jewish tradition. People are making some deliberate decisions. My guess is that the same for Christian tradition. Right? Nobody's quoting this or that passage from the New Testament with you know, just kind of like a plum. They're doing it with intention, with kavanah. So why is this happening? Our most ancient authors, I know, strove to explore, explain, and create associations between things and between narratives. All of our narratives are intertwinable. All constitute an ongoing effort to understand and to seek meaning in life. Yes, you absolutely can take a piece of Exodus and you can put it right into Judges and you can say this is why these two things are connected because a single word is being used in both passages. You can do it, we do it. I can prove how you can do it, and it will make sense, believe it or not. So now, knowing that this is intentional, let's go back to the words. Ample is your grace. Rabab emunatecha. 
And these words, what do they proclaim? Rabba emonatecha. Ample is your grace. Clearly, they are saying something about God's faithful, redemptive nature, or at least the hope for God's faithful, redemptive nature. Ample is your grace is a kind of way of saying, remember me, I need you. Right? Yes, Debbie? Yes, sorry. <laughs> it can be translated in different ways, but that's certainly true, yes. Um, what is that's going on here? The source text for these two words, Rabba va'emunotecha, right? The ample is your, gra uh, your, uh, your grace, or as I great in your, as your faithfulness is how I translated it elsewhere. The source for these two words is embedded in a passage in which the speaker of the passage is describing a wrathful God. We've met him before. This is the Gever of chapter 3, who has worn away his flesh and his skin, who has shattered his bones, who has forced him to dwell in darkness, walled him in, and shut him down, and weighed him with chains. Let me remind you of that text. It's on the handout that is over here. I'm not sure if it got passed around, but you can look at it later too. Uh, he has filled me with bitterness, sated me with wormwood. He has broken my teeth on gravel, has ground me into the dust. My life was bereft of peace. It's all right, we could do this in a minute. Let's just listen first. We're good. Has ground me into dust. My life was bereft of peace. I forgot what happiness was. I thought my strength and hope had perished before the Lord. To recall my distress and my misery was wormwood and poison. Whenever I thought of them, I was bowed low. But this do I call in mind. Therefore, I have hope. The kindness of the Lord has not ended. His mercies are not spent. They are renewed every morning. Ample is your grace. Now, what is happening here? The speaker is insisting on hope without any evidence, without any reason to have it. He has been brought to the worst Circumstance. Remember when I told you this reads like the description of somebody who is in Auschwitz, worn away my skin and bones, taken away all my hope, walled me in, chained me. If you really take those words seriously, if you imagine a human being who has had their, their body worn to nothing, they're a skeletal representative of themselves. If you imagine any of the great awful tragedies of this country, if you imagine the destruction of indigenous peoples, if you imagine the absolute horror of an, uh, a, a journey on a slave ship, chained, worn away, walled in, right? Just think about it. And, and what do you meet when you get to arrive after most of you have died, or many of you have died. And you've watched that happen. You've traveled with the corpses of your friends and family next to you, and then you get to that country and you're living in slavery. Whether it's the indigenous, the destruction of indigenous peoples, whether it's the destruction of Africans, no matter how you shake it, we have known what it is to do just that, or experience just that, one way or another. And so in that place, in that location, sometimes you cry out without any evidence of God's mercy. There's none around you to find. It's not there. It is your longing for God's mercy. It's your longing for God's hope. This speaker no longer knows what happiness is and says so. He says to remember his pain is to basically take in poison. And still... 
he has that hope. In the face of death, he utters a phrase that will centuries later close moda ani, ample is your grace. I don't want to go to the easy place here. I want us to be able to sit with this as straddling the anguish and pain with the longing and the hope. Because I am sure, David, and I'm sure, Alice, and I believe it was Jackie back there, who I can't, right, and Debbie. I am sure that all of you know what it is to wake up with the pain being so overwhelming that it is filling your entire body and then to long to hope for some sources, some relief from that pain. To long for God to hold you and say, I am holding you and know that you are being held. So where can we go with this? Lamentations does not blindly trust. Lamentations names and describes absolute utter desolation, physical and spiritual. Yet the speakers in it long for redemption, for peace, for purpose, and for God, even the God they accuse. The author of Modet Ani ended a prayer of gratitude with the plea of a desperate person whose life is surrounded by death. Kathleen O'Connor writes, Lamentations marks out the place of ruptured life where the old story fails and a new one has yet to appear. That ruptured life, that moment that Debbie described, it'll never be the same. I can't go back. And I don't know what the future is going to mean. I can't go back. There's a rupture. Those who work with the dying have learned a really important lesson. The dying and those who accompany them really and truly know how precious life is in a way that we forget in our daily movement and existence. Dying, what we learn is that there is no place for cruelty in the world and this awareness is not naive. Death is actually a teacher. In the life left to live, miracles of reconciliation can occur. A conversation of 10 minutes becomes a legacy. This is what Jackie didn't get to experience, right? Didn't get that. But that's not the stuff of Hallmark cards. It is not maudlin movies here. This is the stuff of the narrative of human life and the divine grace that created it. The world of death here opens into a world of life, strangely. When you are faced with the real fragility of human life, you take in the specificity of a single sunset, the that rich familiarity of the voice of the beloved, the presence of the love that you learn actually is eternal. Because nothing can take away the love you had for your brother and sister that will never be eradicated. Even when you are gone, it is out there in the world doing its work by every moment you remember either one, by how stories keep getting told, and surely and purely by the fact that it exists. I believe that. I believe that that love, that all of you know for those you have lost is an undying thing, that it goes into the world like a butterfly and it moves around out there in ways you cannot possibly imagine. Some things last forever. 
And so we acquire the right to recite Moda Ani as mature and conscious adults when we figure that out. Then we can grasp the import of each of its 12 words. Then we can place ourselves before God and without reservations. And then in the presence of God, in the light of both death and life, we can actually inhabit eternity and know that we have a place in it. We are all living in the company of death. Every one of us right now. We've known what it is to live in the company of death in an acute way during this pandemic. And there are some among us who've known what it's like to live like that all their lives. The students I have who come from minority communities who can tell me, Dr. Tita, when you white people get all upset about gun violence, let me tell you I've lived it. I've grown up with it. I've grown up with desperation. I've grown up with hunger. I've grown up with fear in ways that you, in your middle class, privileged life, have never had to experience. And they are right. They are absolutely right. They have known what it is to live in the company of death. We are permitted by our text to lament, to mourn, to grieve, to bemoan, to deplore, to regret, bewail, cry, howl, wail, weep, sob, sorrow. All of those things are permitted to us because this text is part of our canon. Truly, did we not have this text? We would never find the permission to rage against the cruelty and the evil and the horror and the, the terrible, unpredictable disaster that can happen at any moment. But because of this text, we've been given that permission by those who went before us, and that means that moda'ani in Jewish tradition, the rabbis got this right. It is not asking us to proclaim some childish and Pyrrhic victory in the morning. Thank you, God, that I'm still alive. That's not what this prayer is about. It is asking us to live a life where we wake up conscious of the fragility of all life. To thank God for the grace that has given birth to the miracle of the existence around us. However we describe that grace and however we describe its source, its words are not a simple recitation of that triumph of life, but an awareness of life's fragility. If we recite it this way, then we know grace and purpose in this broken and fragile world. We know to love each other. We know to love the world. We know to love God by saying moda ani. Okay, my friends, your turn. Thoughts or comments or questions? Don't be shy. Remember my moniker, or no, moniker is the wrong word, my phrase, be shy in your own time. Let's do that, Jackie, and whoever comes after you, just hand it over. I will. Go ahead. Um, Rabbi Barbara, I would just really um, like to thank you for embracing um, the grief and sorrow and the anger and the wailing that comes in, in the Book of Lamentations. I think so often in um, our culture today and even in our church, Christian churches that we just think three days and it's over and you move on with life. Um, and it's a lifelong grief that you learn to live with. And um, I give thanks for the people that I've lost that I love deeply, that helped shape me 
And um, it's just been through COVID, there's so much grief that people don't want to talk about. And in order to heal as individuals, as communities, and as a country, we need to talk about what happened during that period of time and grieve it, embrace it, and move on through with that change in who we are and what we are. Um, Recently, my granddaughter, who is now 13, was visiting me, and I no I've noticed a change in her, and of course, part of it is just being 13, but, but she looked at me and she said, matter of fact, my life shut down when I was 11. Shut down, she used the word shut down. Mm -hmm. She said, I had to leave elementary school without telling anyone goodbye. There was no celebration to transfer me into middle school. And all the things I was doing and love doing stopped. And now I'm too old to go back and do them. And I don't know where I'm fit in now. And, and I thought that was really powerful and insightful yep. for a 13 year old. And, and I think that that's like what many of us are feeling is when we shut down, we thought we would go back in two or three months to what we were doing. And then two and a half years later, we're still trying to figure out where, where we're going. So the Book of Lamentations covers our feelings and our prayers and gives us hope. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. You are very welcome. And I, I want to say uh, I have a particular personal bugaboo around the American style of dealing with grief and death and horror. Um, in Jewish tradition, we have all sorts of rituals for loss. We have rituals uh, that have to do with, you know, sitting for a week just to mourn. Uh, 30 days of certain things you are, you're not required to do. You're not required to be social. You're not required to do parties. You're not required to do this or that, right? Understanding, and after that first week of mourning, what happens to the person who is, is in mourning, who has been sitting and mourning for a week? Somebody takes them on a walk around the block, as their first re-entry into life, you want to be tender, you want to be gentle, you want to be loving about those things, and you want to give it time. There are rituals around, you know, every single year on the anniversary of a person's death, what is it that you do to remember them, right? We do have a chronic need to just keep on moving without recognizing pain, and we have a generation of children who have just been through war. They've just been through war, and your granddaughter has described it, yes. Thank you, Jackie. What you described about um, the long morning, um, I didn't really participate in this because I was an infant, but my family mourned for the entire summer from the time I was five months old until, well, they still are probably. Um, my father went fishing one day in May in the uh, cold waters of the, the Canadian Maritimes. And um, the canoe tipped over, and he was seen going down yelling for help. But he was wearing hip waders and heavy clothes. And his body was never found. So oh, that whole first summer, was spent looking for him and what my family got for really all my life was people saying, well, he just ran away. He never, you know, because there was no body. Oh, God. Uh, so uh, I've sort of grieved my father my whole life, but I never knew him. That's an empty place, right? It's, that's the hole, you can't fill it. Mm -hmm. One of the issues here is when you've got that kind of thing, right? Like how, how is it that you live with that? When my son was uh, 
would have been four. Uh, Eric was extremely shy as a, a child, painfully shy. And we sent him to a preschool. We wanted him only to go twice a, a week because we were afraid of how well he would do with it in, in addition. His first language was German in those days, so his, it was his second language that was English, and so we were a little bit worried about all this. We only could get him into a preschool that had three days a week. And, and one day, I, I called the, the teacher, Norma Wright was her name, and to ask her how he was doing. And she said, you know, he's hanging back. He's a little bit on the shy. He likes to observe, but he's doing okay. And I said, well, Norma, I am just incredibly grateful to say that he really feels safe with you, and I know that from what he's saying. And then I chit-chatted, you know, do you have children, Norma? She did. I have two daughters, she says. And I say, oh, that, that's a challenge to, you know, they were in their teenage years, right? Like we talked about that. And then Norma started crying. And she said, I had a son. And people, it's been five years. I should stop doing this already. I should stop. People want me to stop. I said, Norma, you've lost a child. You know, when you're 99, you're gonna be grieving your child. When you're 99, you'll grieve the father you didn't know. Tell me about him. He was diagnosed with a tumor in his brain when he was two. They didn't expect him to live as long as they did. And so she told me about him. And I said, would you like to come over and bring me pictures? Would you like to tell me about him? She said, yes, I would. And at the end of the conversation, I said again to her, I want to again th thank you again for helping Eric find a safe space. And she said, all Eric's are special. Right. Barbara, I feel like we could talk about this, all of this for all day and the rest of the week. Um, and there are several pieces that I wanted to say. Thank you for walking beside me during my early grief mm -hmm. and for giving me permission to adopt some of the Jewish rituals mm -hmm. to help me mark my passage. It was extremely helpful to me and continues to be. Um, total change of subject. <laughs> when I read Lamentations 3 this morning in anticipation of this session, I, was, I, I responded with anger. Um, and you might not have time or even want to address this piece of it, but the, the speaker blames God for everything. Mm -hmm even the evil behavior of fellow man and woman. Um, and I was struck by the fact that there was no blame directed at the, the humans who were mistreating him, but only at God. God was responsible for everything. God refused to hear his prayer. God turned his back, God's back, on the speaker. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know how to bridge for that with the hope, just out of nowhere, he says, and yet you are love, I will have hope. And I thought, how do you, how can you call that love? Yeah, so theology, right? Let's get into some theology, right? Isaiah, which I mentioned earlier, God is the creator of weal and woe. God is the creator of everything. All that is good comes from God, all that is bad comes from God. Now, in Christian circles, what we have is a really different way to cast the blame. God represents all good. There's a supernatural evil force, and we can blame that supernatural evil force for all bad, right? The devil made me do it is, was when in my childhood was the kind of way people did that, you know, speciously. No matter which theology you choose, it is an endemic problem that if you believe either that God created evil and good, God gets to be the fall guy for human horror. 
And if you believe that it's all Satan's work, then Satan gets to be responsible for all human horror. If there is one thing that we need more of, it is extracting from our textual tradition where it says, figure out your role in the covenantal relationship that you have. I may have mentioned the first or second session or Rabbi Irving Greenberg's statement that after the Holocaust, Jews had to recognize that no, God doesn't just move in history to fix things, didn't do it. So what is the covenant that God is calling us to? It's not a covenant that says, oh, God's gonna come in and repair human horror. God will not. So the covenant that we must rise to, the theology we must get to, is a new covenantal agreement of our responsibility for the horrors that exist on this earth. Full acknowledgement, not partial, but full, right, for human horror. So there's been a necessary theological movement, right? And you remember when Moses says to the Israelites, don't think you're chosen because you're special. <laughs> uh -huh. It's just because you've been given the charge to follow the law and do and act righteously. Justice, justice shall you pursue, right? So there's plenty of textual material that is calling us to our responsibility to love the stranger among us, to take care of the widow and the children is said no less than 36 times. It's like not buried in there, right? So I also want to say the instinct to blame God is so powerful. I remember when my sister's cancer after stem cell therapy, and it was, in, it was a new thing at that time, it killed a certain percentage of the people who did it, right? She survived that. It first appeared to be in remission. In January 1996, the cancer was in her brain, it was in her lungs, it was in her, you know, it was, it was everywhere. And I remember her saying, what did I do to deserve this? The instinct we have that makes it hard for us to say things happen and it's not you that deserved what happened to you, but humanity that might deserve this. To ask itself why it is that country after country after country spends billions and billions and billions of dollars on weaponry to kill each other. Compare that with the amount we spend on solving disease, Alzheimer's, cancer, whatever it is. That's a drop in the bucket compared to what we spend our money in. Who's responsible? My sister didn't do anything to deserve it, but humanity has sure as hell done plenty to deserve the grief and the pain of preventable diseases or those we have yet to learn how to prevent and how to cure because of where we put our priorities. Just saying. And my vision of the God who watches us do that is a God who laments. God is lamenting. God is angry maybe with us or at least sad or anguished. Why are you not getting it? Why have you not gotten it? Yeah. Uh, other thoughts? To be mindful of your time. Well, my friends, there are no easy answers to any of this. And I want to say that if you can muster up the courage to live a conscious life, then somebody every day will give you the opportunity to love the hell out of this world.
Yesterday was the anniversary of my, one of my students' divorce. They're a transgender student who lived five years in an abusive relationship. And all day yesterday, I was kind of doing this little prayer. Know that your life, you are entitled to joy. Your body is entitled to safety. Joy now, joy in the future. And my intention, I spoke to, her, uh, to them before they left to visit family members. And when they come back, to say, did you have some joy? Cling to that. Cling to hope, cling to joy, and cling to love. Because if you do, it will be everywhere around you. And Barbara, one more thing before sure. you wrap up. What is today? Ah, today is Tisha B'Av. It is the day of lamentations. It is the day in which Jews read this text. Um, many fast for part or the whole day. It is a day in which uh, frequently one of the ways people remember is sometimes to disorient, to have people come into a sanctuary where things are lying on their sides, chairs are scattered around, where you have to actually walk into a holy place and see destruction. And then set it to rights, read the book, ask yourself what it is that you need to learn. So yes, today marks Tisha B'Av, which is why I told Rev the Reverend Nancy Cox, it's perfect for me to end with Muda Ani on Tisha B'Av. Thanks for asking.